I have to begin by first thanking the program committee of ICTSTFR for accepting our proposal for organizing this workshop. And then I simply thank Shantan for convincing me to give this talk. And it is my incompetence uh, as an organizer that I couldn't convince back him back to, uh, I couldn't convince back him to give, that, give, give his talk. He initially was agree agreeable to it, and, but then at the end, he somehow uh, uh, didn't do that. So, but anyway, so uh, thanks Shantan for uh, convincing me to give the talk. And uh, yes, so uh, I'll be talking about uh, something that I've been doing for last six years, which started with Edmond, uh, and then it I carried it over to Vienna and now in Chennai. So, uh, okay, so yeah. So this is uh, uh, some compulsory slide. And then I start with a little bit of a brief history. Uh, so here is Edmond with whom I wrote my first paper right around in 2014 on the subject. And then when I went to move to Vienna, I was working with these uh, three people, especially with Tony and Flo, with whom I wrote many papers. And then Alex joined us uh, for his, uh, during his PhD. And this is a picture of him when he visited me in India. It's a beach very close to my home. And uh, then we also started working with Alexi. This is a picture of Alexi in our last Bangalore workshop. And we went to a restaurant which gave us a turban to wear and he was extremely happy about it. So, and then I also worked on some fundamental aspects with Shobhik and Navar Gaddam, who uh, he's now at Utrecht, he's now in Wurzburg. And then helped us a lot. And then when I moved to Chennai, I worked with, I'm now working with my students, Sukrut and Toshali. And I also have also worked on non-formal liquids, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but we have also coming up uh, some paper on strange metals coming up. So if you would like to take a look at it. And my talk today will be based on this following papers. Uh, if I count, there are six and there are some ongoing works. And I will al always refer the papers uh, by the abbreviations like IM or MPRS, referring to the names, the surnames of the authors then this BGM, then with Alexi, this was uh, KMPRS, EMPRS, and now we have a very nice acronym, MMMRS. Uh, okay, then we have ongoing works too. So this will be roughly the plan of the talk. I will first have a rather superficial introduction uh, telling you why we need to combine both weak and strong degrees of freedom, weakly interacting and strongly interacting degrees of freedom to have an understanding of uh, the coagulant plasma. And then I will discuss the principles on which we construct such a framework where we include uh, and wh what are basic principles uh, in which we are constructing such, this, such a framework. And then I will do some very important consistency checks of this framework to, cons to convince you that it is kind of uh, really uh, something that agrees with basic physics. And then I will talk of applications. My first application would be to thermodynamics of, the, of, of QCD. Uh, to have some, and this will be rather sketchy, uh, but the main part would be how we can apply this to heavy end collisions. And I will explain that the numerical scheme schemes do indeed work by a toy example. It will already quite a, non, a quite non-trivial example. And then I will give a brief, uh, uh, then I will say that, okay, this is currently very hard to do numerical simulations because you have to do some solve simultaneously gravitational equations and also the Glasma equations or kinetic theory equations and doing one itself is already requires quite some expertise and doing it them both together is another level. So, I mean, we are getting there, but then we will say that even before investing in that kind of direction, we would try to get, understand qualitatively what the picture could look like. And this will bring us into hydrodynamic attractors with this hybrid degrees of freedom. This was already talked by Toshali, but I will give a brief review and also motivate it. Uh, and I will, I will just say something, uh, this will be brief. And I will also talk about hybrid quasi-normal modes and to get some picture of this too. And these two together will make up a very nice story. Uh, and I will conclude and end with an outlook and so here I will start with a rather superficial introduction. 
but before even starting the introduction, what I will do is that I will just give you a very cryptic way to capture the main message of the talk, which will come out of this uh, simplified pictures, which I mentioned, which I just mentioned. And this is a quote by Milan Pundera. Uh, he, this, this is regarding uh, actually the love, aff love affair of two very special characters in his uh, very famous book, The, Un the Unbearable Lightness of Being. Um, so this is, uh, this quote runs like this, but when the strong were too weak to hurt the weak, the weak had to be strong enough to leave. But actually this actually captures semi holography pretty well. That will be my, but this is, this looks rather cryptic and it will become clear perhaps in the, towards the end. Okay, so I will give a rather superficial introduction as I said before. Um, so we all know that the quorum plasma is probably one of the most complex and perplexing phases of matter is essentially because uh, uh, the degrees of freedom of are very, very complex and it, it involves in, um, different scales of energies, which is very important. And understanding uh, the quark gluon plasma can actually help us to understand what gauge theories really are, because of course, gauge theories are not simply described by the Lagrangian, simply by the classical Lagrangian. And uh, so it's what probably one of the most incredibly complex, uh, and obviously it is one of the problems of the millennium, as we all know. So in the context of QGP, uh, we know that, uh, that the low PT hadrons uh, that are emitted, uh, they do tell us that they have some kind of collective flow and which can be understood by hydrodynamic models very successfully. And, uh, but the hydrodynamic should be started at some time, it takes light to traverse the system. It means that somehow uh, the system hydronomizes extremely fast. And, uh, and this is something that qualitatively seems to be captured by uh, holographic duality of string theory, but now many of the weak coupling approaches with overoccupied uh, initial conditions also seem to reproduce it. But there's still one can argue that there's a factor of two at least discrepancy between what you actually see and uh, what actually uh, what actually transpires out. But one of the main uh, reasons to uh, argue that we need strong coupling physics is comes from the lattice, is that we know that if these kind of temperatures uh, at, at least at rig energies uh, that we have between TC and T 2TC, the medium cannot be understood perturbatively. And actually, uh, it would have been wonderful if Shantan would have gave a talk on this. And he has done a lot of work on this particular area. He has to understand how the, in fact, uh, the lattice methods have now been also uh, improved to understand even the degrees of freedom, probe the degrees of freedom of the system. And it looks like it's, it, it, it is very complex uh, in this, at, at, at least in this range of uh, temperatures. But yet uh, the other thing is that when we look at very high PT jets, uh, especially uh, which are just called collimated hadron space, very loosely speaking, as we heard in the talk by yesterday's talk, these can be described very well by perturbation theory and they very badly fit holographic models. In fact, holographic models give a very uh, overestimate the energy loss uh, and things like that. So, um, so and, and then we have no way to even understand the intermediate PT hadrons. So this is the story so far. Um, so, but what most existing approaches do is that they take exclusively the strong coupling approach or the weak coupling approach Whereas the weak coupling approach should be more valid to as for initial stages and the strong coupling approach should be valid after the plasma is formed. Uh, so basically they will concentrate more or either on the initial part or later part, but uh, to understand many observables like high PT jets and even uh, quarkonia as we have seen in yesterday's talk by Santosh Dash, and we will also see in Conrad, we have seen also in Conrad's talk and we'll see tomorrow, uh, today as well by Binstock that uh, we need to actually take track the entire evolution perhaps, uh, although uh, the perturbative approaches can be well, uh, I mean, for the initial part, you just need the perturbative approaches, but uh, to understand it in a more refined substructure of jets or some more refined things you need uh, to include uh, the entire evolution. And uh, we need actually a very good theoretical framework that can combine both the weak and the strong interacting degrees of freedom together. And actually such a framework can tell us uh, how much of non perturbative QCT we can actually learn from the QGP because, so we need to test all this attractor paradigm and, many, uh, and all these things in this new framework where we combine both and not just have one, only one of them, 
and re-examine this question. And in the context of uh, especially the weak coupling, this question has been examined very well by Soren in Mike's talk. And we will probably hear something also from Paul today, later today. And these are pictures from David's, uh, David Mueller's uh, simulations of the plasma that are valid for the initial stages. And this is uh, just a Riafi-like sim simulations of shockwave collisions in the bulk. And uh, yeah, so these are the two things. And although, I mean, what David also told us, you can produce some picture like this from his methods too, but I think there will be quantitative differences at least. Qualitatively, they may look same, but quantitatively, they will be certainly different. Anyway, so this is uh, my rather superficial int uh, uh, introduction to the topic. So now I start with the basic principles that we need to come up with such a framework, which I advertised. So, uh, so let, let me just state my basic premise then that we start with is that if you look at the quantum effective action of QCD, it will take this following form at any energy scale. We will have this classical action, of course, of the pure blue. Uh, and then there will be perturbative corrections to that, which comes from Feynman diagrams, which is, uh, which is it, it's of course a series that is divergent, um, but uh, it's, it should be understood as asymptotic series. But then in the full theory, we know there should be also non-perturbative corrections. And these are beyond Feynman diagrams. Uh, well, in case of QCD, perhaps the idea of instantons and instanton liquids are rather limited. Uh, we need some genuine way to understand this non-perturbative corrections. And here we simply hypothesize, I mean, which, which is probably um, like the Sakai Sugimoto model, one can say, or uh, they do capture very well the infrared of the QCD and uh, uh, even quantitatively. So at least in a large end limit, we just make a hypothesis that this non-perturbative corrections originate from a strongly coupled holographic theory. So the non-perturbative terms that you cannot generate by Feynman diagrams uh, can, be, uh, can be generated from a strongly coupled holographic theory. And in this following manner, that in the large end limit, you can postulate that it is essentially the partition function of some strongly coupled theory but it will only depend on the sources. The sources are now functionals of the perturbative gauge fields of the perturbative QCD. And since this strongly coupled theory is holographic, we can, we can also un compute this partition function via an onshell gravitational action. And that works like this for every uh, such source, for every such operator that couples to a source, there will be a, there will be a dual field in the gravitational theory. And it, this correspondence works like this. They have the same quantum numbers, the dual, uh, the dual field in the gravitational theory and the operator. And if we expand the uh, gravitational field asymptotically near R goes to zero, where the boundary of the space time is, the first term would be the source. And this the input would come from here, this functionals that you specify. And then at the subleading order, you will can read out the expectation value of the operator. So this, uh, this is how it will, so these sources will act as boundary values of dual fields in the dual gravitational theory in this way. So the important thing is the cutoff of the holographic theory and the scale dependent functionals. Uh, so this uh, holographic theory should have some kind of natural cutoff. It will not be exactly at the boundary of space time, but rather at R is equal to some epsilon that, uh, that implements some UV cutoff of, the, of, of this gravitational theory. And also this particular, uh, the, the, this particular uh, classical gravity action, everything somehow should be determined from the perturbation series because the belief is that somehow the perturbation uh, series determines completely this non-perturbative corrections. Usually it is understood in the form of trans series, but in case of QCD, we have renormalance and in presence of renormalance, it's not so easy to understand the full trans series at least in the case of completely in the case of QCD yet. So, um, so yeah, so we would have to somehow determine this classical gravitational theory from the perturbative, perturbative theory. And in a way one should understand the gravitational theory is only generating some series which can on its own be divergent. And similarly, this particular perturbation series is on its own divergent, but together they make some sense. Okay. Okay, so essentially our inspiration in this is that the, the renormalance of the Borel summation of PQCD can be shown to determine the vacuum expectation values of operators. 
this goes back to work by Paris in 1968 or so. And uh, one can actually conquer or, or some kind of uh, uh, construct, uh, a gravitational model that determine these webs of the operators. And to do that, we need to not only specify the the potential for this particular fields, but also the sources. Once we know the gravitational theory, what is the potential for this for these things, and what is the sources? We can also determine this operator expectation values. So in a way, one can construct. Uh, so given the uh, for PPQ city series, we can understand from the Bodel poles what are the expectation values of these operators and construct an appropriate gravitational theory to describe them. So essentially, this is the idea. And the toy model was actually uh, was already there in my paper with BGM, where we uh, 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 where I didn't actually construct or, or we didn't actually look into the Bodel poles or Renan Malone's. Uh, so we didn't look into these things, but we replaced that with something simpler. But then we were able to show how this exactly works, how we can how we can do it. But this is but my talk will be not about this. And in my talk, I will not uh, say such a, uh, or even talk about such derivation, but rather how one can have such a setup consistently and perform consistency checks of the setup to at least tell you such a setup makes sense. And then I will explore phenomenological consequences for the quark learn plus. So the main question that we are going to deal is as follows, how do we couple the perturbative and non-perturbative sectors? And this actually is a very important question because uh, we have to somehow be consistent with Wilsonian RG. And the naive thing would be that you just simply put a coupling where you take the, uh, say, for example, the stress tensor of the perturbative sector and the, and the stress tensor of the non-perturbative sector, the holographic sector, and you simply couple them like this. And this indeed could be problematic because it spoils the renormalizability. It's a high, higher dimension operator. It's a, it's an irrelevant coupling and things like that. So there, it could be a problem. And then uh, it, we cannot just think of it as a, it, it, this, this cannot be a proper fundamental approach to the, the thing when if we say that it's a effective way to construct non perturbative dynamics at any scale, we run into problem. But this is not the only problem. Uh, we, if you go into the hydronomic limit, then we see that the full energy momentum tensor cannot be just obtained from the hydronomics of the subsectors. So if you just know, but we, but if you know only the hydronomics of the perturbative sector, we should be able to get the full non-perturbative hydronomics because hydronomics is an effective theory. And if you know perturbative dynamics at any scale, you will be able to get the full non-perturbative dynamics. At least that's what we believe. And here we run into a conflict. And actually, if you try to derive the full energy momentum tensor from an operator like this, you will immediately see you will get. Uh, not only T mu, but also some operators like trace of F mu alpha, F alpha mu, and these operators can can receive very high, can have very large anomalous dimensions, and we have no idea how to parameterize such operators or expectation values of such operators in terms of hydro variables unless we get more microscopic information. So this looks a bit of a problem that we we need uh, even to construct the hydronomics of the full system. We need to know something beyond some scale, uh, we cannot simply construct a hydronomic theory uh, on its own. So this is, looks uh, very uh, problematic. In fact, we cannot write the full T menu of the system uh, in terms of hydronomic vari variables of the perturbative sector alone. So uh, now this is not a problem if you're thinking of a mixture of water and alcohol, but here it is because to understand the hydro hydronomics of water and alcohol, we need some microscopic interaction about how they interact with each other. So the rules of the coupling that we set up are, has been, we started in this paper and then with, uh, in this KMPRS paper, we have had a more correct and complete formulation. So this is how it goes that uh, uh, postulate is as follows that you take these two systems uh, as self-consistent isolated systems. Uh, so they actually, uh, they are, uh, uh, they live in some background, some metric background, which can be Jimmy new. Uh, so these, uh, these, these blue color would refer to the perturbative system and these red colors will refer to the holographic system. And what you postulate is this, for the perturbative system, uh, the couplings and the effective metric, they get determined by the operators of the holographic sector and mutually the coupling and the effective metric, which will be the boundary metric for the dual gravitational theory, the, that is a metric on which the holographic degrees of freedom are living 
these two are getting determined by the operators of the perturbative sector in, in this way. So any, in a way, they are just simply mutually, uh, they're the, they isolated system, but they are, um, uh, but they're self-consistent. They have to be solved in a self-consistent manner. So the relevant and marginal couplings are promoted to algebraic functions of the operators of the complements, and this is democratically. So they, I mean, in a way you can think that what it means is that you can either integrate out, uh, you can write either the full theory in terms of perturbative variables, or you can write the full theory in terms of non-perturbative variables. Uh, you can choose to do either way. Uh, the full system is, as I said, uh, so what happens is that each individual sector remains renormalizable. So you can, because each sets, each, each on its own uh, is simply uh, isolated system with uh, some self-consistent sources, you could, and, uh, and these sources are only, only marginal. So you will be able to construct a renormalizable theory uh, at each, and so there are two things that you, you so renormalization would be well-defined. So question is what determines these functions? How do you determine these functions, uh, uh, these algebraic functions that determine the sources of the mutual theory? And the idea is very simple that there must exist energy momentum tensor of the full system that is conserved in the actual background metric on which is the flat space metric for practical purposes on which all the degrees of freedom are actually living. And this full energy momentum tensor would be a polynomial of the relevant and marginal single trace operators of the subsystems. And these, these operators are only small anomalous dimensions in the large and limit. So this is a statement. And, uh, and similarly, if you have other conserved currents uh, in the full theory, the same statement would apply. Now, away from large and limit, it becomes more complicated. You need to take into account also correlation functions of this. I will have not much to say about it. Uh, but in time, I will say a bit more about it. So one example of how to implement such coupling is, uh, so we actually found couplings independently of this idea, but, oh, so, but you can actually understand this uh, couplings very nicely by an augmented action uh, principle that uh, actually Alex found out during his PhD. And this work occurs like that. You can think of the uh, perturbative sector uh, so this is not, ex you should rather think of it as a perturbation series. Uh, and uh, so this has some coupling, the tooth coupling, and this tooth coupling is a standard one over G angle square N, plus there are some corrections H1. And this uh, holotropic sector, uh, and you will have its own tooth coupling. You can take this tooth coupling to infinity. So one over GM, G, uh, this will be zero because this is inverse tooth coupling actually, this will become zero, but then it will have a, small correction h2 and you write an action for h1 h2 it's a simple algebraic action and these are auxiliary variables if you now solve for h1 you will see that if you just differentiate with respect to h2 and take its uh, extremize with respect to it the equation will simply be h1 is uh, beta times the operator that uh, uh, that couples to h2 here and that is nothing but uh, the the f square of the holographic theory and similarly, H2 will be uh, equal to the F squared term of the, uh, which couples to the tooth coupling is one over lambda times trace of this is simply the kinetic term of the, of, of the, of, of the angles theory. So this is how it is. If you, if you solve for H1, H2, that's what we get. And then uh, if, we, if we can compute the energy quantum tensor of the full theory now by differentiating with respect to the background metric. And then if you insert the solutions for the sources, this is the full QMU that we are getting. And uh, as a consistency check, since each system is isolated, they must satisfy the each individual word identity. That is obvious because these actions are diffeomorphism invariant on their own. So they will have the individual word identities and that will be del T is equal to H uh, del mu H2 and del T tilde mu nu will be so such and so forth. And you can easily see that the, the individual word identities of the subsystems automatically imply this full energy momentum tensor is conserved uh, that's, so if you solve the system cells consistently, then the full energy momentum tensor of the theory is also conserved. But this is a rather easy example. Let us see a more non-trivial example. And here we are talking of effective metric couplings. So you say now that the first system lives in this blue effective metric and the holographic system lives in the red effective metric. And you can determine these two from this auxiliary uh, uh, terms. 
uh, and uh, the and this GB mu nu is actually the actual physical background metric on which all degrees of freedom are living. And we have this action now. We have two kinds of terms here. Uh, so if you solve now this, uh, if you vary with respect to G and G tilde, you easily get that they are determined uh, by the respective operators in this way. So the blue metric is determined by the red subsystem so energy momentum tensor, and the red metric is determined by the blue system's energy momentum tensor. And you see there are two different kind of contractions uh, here. Um, so this is more like a tensor-like uh, uh, thing coupling, and this is more like a scalar-like coupling, pure trace-like coupling. The two possible coupling, and they, it, it is in a very democratic fashion. And then again, you can compute the full T menu by simply taking this full action and differentiate with respect to GB menu. If you do that, it's a very long calculation, and then you uh, simply substitute the result for G and G tilde that you obtained before. And this is a full T menu that you get. And now you can just simply express as a polynomial of the subsystem energy momentum tensors. And uh, that is what we wanted. So if you know the hydrodynamics of the subsystems, you can know the, you know how the full T menu can be represented in terms of hydrodynamic variables, for example. And okay, so, uh, so uh, here all this indices, all the blue indices has to be raised and lowered with G or inverse blue G or inverse of that. And the red indices have to be all uh, raised and lowered with respect to uh, inverse of G tilde, uh, inverse of the red G or uh, G itself, G tilde itself. And, uh, and for the un, 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 uncolored indices, a black indices will be with GB. So that's how it goes. Now, again, because each of the subsystems are isolated, they will have the individual water entities. So this blue T menu will be conserved on its own background and the red T menu will be conserved on its own red background. And then it's a nice exercise in an elementary, in an undergraduate GR course maybe to, to show that these two, uh, these conservations, and if you assume these kind of relations uh, of, of G with the GB, background metric, this full T menu will now be conserved in the, in the physical background metric, which again, for practical purposes has to be the flat metric. And uh, for that, you just need to uh, uh, know how to uh, relate the Levitavita tensors of GB mu nu with G and G tilde. That is, uh, that's a very simple exercise. And once you do understand that, you can easily show that this is true. So, now there are infinite number of possible such scalar vector and tensor couplings that you could write down and uh, and they are all most likely necessary to have a full kind of non perturbative meaningful expansion that uh, or some sort of a trans series expansion that makes sense. And uh, we have classified all such possible scalar and uh, tensor couplings that can arise, but for practical apl applications, we only need a lowest order couplings. And, the, uh, and there is also a very nice justification. What you do is that what you can see if you make this uh, into mutual coupling gamma and gamma, gamma prime very, very, very large, all of our calculations of from coming from thermodynamics, from relaxation modes, from hydrodynamic modes, tells you that the full system then becomes conformal when in the limit when gamma and gamma prime becomes infinity. But gamma and gamma prime are dimension full objects. What is really dimensionless is gamma times the energy density or the energy densities of mutual systems, so typical energy density. So, so, so essentially we need, if the energy densities are, if this coupling as measured in terms of, uh, in terms of the energy densities are small, then and the mutual coupling is weak, then this system is actually much more interesting. Otherwise, if it is very, very large, this mutual coupling is very large. In fact, even if order one or order two or three, the system is already very close to a conformal system and this is not what we need. So for most interesting prep purposes, I think it, this coupling has to be weak and then you have some kind of systematic expansion. So, uh, so then you could simply truncate to the lowest order couplings because you can think of it as an expansion in, 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 in the energy density essentially. Okay, so the consequence of democratic coupling is now that we can actually couple with anything with anything and we can use this coupling to couple glasma kinetic theory to a black hole because after all, we do not need actions anymore. You simply need to know what the subsystem T menus are. Uh, for example, if you know hydrodynamics, you can implement uh, equations hydrodynamics from the subsystem water entities only and you don't need actually the action. You, 
or you can just couple kinetic theory to black hole, you can couple to dissipative fluids, because uh, all that you need to do is to somehow have a scheme where this energy momentum tensor is conserved on its own, this is conserved on its own, and then you guarantee that the full energy momentum tensor has to be conserved. And we can express the full T mu in terms of subsystem T mu. So you can actually ap apply even when you do not know such an action principle. Okay, so uh, as I said, the, the two systems are not to be independent of each other, but together they should make some nice trans series. But however, in the context of application to HIC, we will not propose a derivation. We will simply use PQCD for, uh, for S1, and then for S2, we can either use some very simple uh, ADS, uh, some kind of 5D Einstein gravity with a negative cosmological constant, or we can also replace it by some bottom-up holographic QCD model. Anyway, so what I'm going to say, uh, so one first question is, are this, uh, does this make sense? So, uh, so uh, is, this, is the full system actually at finite temperature consistent? And uh, so what we do is as follows, to, uh, so let us see if we can describe uh, the full system consistently at a finite temperature. And for that, what we do is, since the full system is at equilibrium, the subsystems must also be at some equilibrium, at some temperature T1 and T2, and since at equilibrium, you can have only one frame, only one global frame, in that global frame, the uh, subsystem in a effective metric should take this particular form uh, with uh, some, because you break, break boost invariance, a, a need not be same as B, it will look something like that. And then you have to, you, you should have some input for uh, the equation of state for each of the subsystems. If they are given, then obviously you can construct T1 and S1, the temperature and entropy density for each of the subsystems by applying these two uh, thermodynamic identities. And the T menu for, uh, for the perturbative system will look like this. T menu for the non perturbative system will look the same, except with A replaced by A tildes and B replaced with B tildes. And the coupling equations, the effective metric coupling equations that These equations that I showed you earlier, these equations in the case of thermodynamic equilibrium will simply reduce to our, if we reduce to this. And uh, so once you specify the, the equation of states, you can solve A, Bs, uh, A's and Bs uh, from these four equations. And, but however, uh, the, full, the full solution will have only one parameter because you have to say that the, uh, there is only one periodicity of a thermal circle which relates the two temperatures in this specific way. The, the, the length of the thermal circle is T1A actually, where A is square root minus G00, and A tilde is simply the, the square root G00 of the other system, square root of that, and B has to be the, is equal to the full system temperature. And then you can solve for the T menu. I had an expression before. If you simply, it's a polynomial of the, the two T menus. And if you com compute that, you get this for the total energy density, this for the total pressure. So everything looks fine because the full solution is only specified by one number with the temperature of the full system. So what can go wrong? Well, now here comes the problem. What can go wrong is as follows, that you have the energy and the pressure of the full system from where you can construct the temperature and the entropy density of the full system as well. And so once you know this, your T and S becomes uniquely specified because the two equations which determine T and S. However, T and S has to satisfy two additional conditions. This is a, con this is a condition that we had already put in to, to, to arrive at the solution, which is a thermodynamic consistency that the temperatures of the two subsystems, effective temp the real temperatures of the two subsystems has to be equal to the system temperature. That's one important relation. And the other relation is also comes from statistical mechanics because the, we have two self-consistent isolated systems, the total entropy must add up. But the total entropy of the system is not simply S1, but S1 BQ is the volume of the effective volume. So you have to also multiply by the effective volume factor. And once you do that, the full entropy is simply add up. So this is a statistical consistency that you should satisfy. The question is that you can determine T and S from a thermodynamic identities once you compute the full energy quantum tensor. Once you compute these two, whether they will agree or be consistent with these two requirements. And, now, and then we, can, we have been able to prove that for any democratic effective metric coupling, the full system is thermodynamic and statistically consistent. 
So since I'm run, running a little bit uh, late of time, I won't have time to discuss the proof. Otherwise, I plan to discuss it. Um, actually, the proof is rather simple, but I'll skip. If there's a question, I'll come back to it at the end. And uh, we can also have a converse theorem, which is that if, if for any coupling of the two systems where the full energy bonded tensors are polynomial of the subsystem energy bonded tensors, this of course is a very non-trivial requirement, right? The full energy bonded tensor is a polynomial of the subsystem energy bonded tensor is not, does not happen, happen for any coupling, but for any coupling for where this is true and thermodynamic and statistical consistency also holds, the coupling of the systems has to be an effective uh, democratic effective metric coupling. So these are two very powerful theorems. It's not only with the lower order couplings, but with any higher order couplings, uh, it will be true. So, so our, our coupling satisfies this basic consistency condition that uh, the, the, the T and S that you get from thermodynamic identities will have uh, these particular, uh, which will be consistent with these two requirements, fundamental requirements. Okay, so now I just simply move on to our applications. Uh, so, uh, so one for, for the simplest thing, again, it's not really an application. We just want to test what, what we get. And for the, for, uh, so before going there, we also need to put in two additional requirements that, uh, so if you look into these two effective metrics, uh, A, uh, it's obvious that A by B is a light cone velocity of the blue metric and A tilde by B tilde is a light cone velocity of the of the uh, red metric and both of them should be has to be less than one which is the light cone velocity of the actual physical background eta mu nu and this is a this is a causal requirement so we cannot just take any particular solution of the system our a's and b's have to satisfy this and then a and because we want lorentzian signature ab cube and has to be greater than zero and so for the red metric for the for the red system and UV completeness will require the such solutions should exist at any temperature. So to, these requirements are satisfied if gamma is greater than zero, that one of the one of our effective metric couplings and the R would be, which is the ratio of gamma prime and gamma is greater than one. So for realistic model, we need to take epsilon one T1 from the HTL resum PQCD and epsilon two T2 from holographic QCD. And, uh, and then uh, all these things, but what we do is simply couple two con conformal subsystems where we have epsilon one T1, N1 T1 to the power four, epsilon T2 to be N2 to T2 to the power four. And what we get is as follows that when R is, uh, so we see that there is some kind of a uh, thermodynamic phase transition where, as I said, at, at very low, weak coupling or at low temperature, the system, uh, because the coupling is, uh, because these two systems are conformal, uh, it can only depend on the coupling through gamma t to the power four. So either, uh, so if you change gamma is equivalent to changing your temperature. So at low temperature, it is just simply two decoupled conformal systems. At high temperature, we get a composite conformal system. At intermediate temperature, the e equation of state of the full system is not conformal because there's a dimension full of uh, coupling gamma after all gamma and gamma prime. And for this particular ratio R of the couplings, when it is greater than a critical value, it is a crossover. For R is equal to RC, it's a second order phase transition. And when, when you have this, but you, you cannot have R less than one for uh, UV completeness, which I mentioned earlier. So in this case, it's a phase transition. So let us see how the plots look like. So for R greater than RC, you have this, how the full pressure behaves you go from one value of P, to the P, P by T to the power four to a higher value. And if you look at the trace of the energy momentum tensor, you see that it is, uh, it, it is non-zero only during this crossover time. And then it again goes back to zero at higher values of the coupling. And as you see that when the mutual coupling is of order two or so, the speed of sound again becomes conformal, but it goes below the conformal limit here, at least for the lowest order coupling, it is always goes below uh, the conformal uh, uh, limit. Now in this particular range of R's, you see a first order transition, the pressure is con continuous, but the derivative of the pressure, which is entropy, that becomes discontinuous, the jump. Of course, if you have a, you can also go through a superheating phase. If you just heat the system quickly, it will first it will follow the red curve and then jump here. And on the other hand, if you are super cooling the system very fast, it will not immediately jump here, but follow the blue curve and jump. And in between this red dotted curve is an unphysical curve because 
you simply have a negative differential with respect to temperature of entropy, it cannot be physically realized. So this is the standard first order phase transition in this region. And to find the critical point, one has to simply look at the light cone velocities. So if you, if you just put N1 is equal to N2 is equal to one, that's easy to see. The light cone velocity actually drops from one to some other limiting value at infinite coupling. And, uh, and then as you keep lowering R, it starts dropping to zero. Uh, of course, R is equal to one is not physical, but it goes as close as possible to zero as possible. And then uh, somewhere in between, the slope is just, nine, is, is, is just inf infinite. And this is where you find the critical point. And what you can see is that uh, from this kind of picture and analytically you can easily show that this alpha, this critical exponent of the specific heat will be two thirds for any value of N1 and N2. And the same in the 2D Ashkin Teller model, it doesn't, of, it's not of course the lattice to O4 model. So we see that we somehow are able to uh, get some glimpse of this, but obviously our gamma prime has nothing to do with the chemical potential in the actual QCD phase diagram, but we have some sort of thing like this where we have a crossover and uh, versus, uh, versus some kind of a, a first order transition and a critical point but this gamma prime is effectively a pure trace interaction and can be in principle turned on by a chemical potential which we didn't put in, which is a rho rho tilde kind of coupling the, the charge densities of the two system. It will affect the thermodynamics and it is a pure trace or rather JMU, JMU kind of interaction. Uh, so the question would be, can we reproduce uh, some kind of catrace of the QCD phase diagram in this fashion that we are talking about, maybe you know, coupling some kind of HTL thermodynamics with some holographic QCD bottom-up system and try to understand this. So that would be one interesting question that we would like to see, or at least try to see if we can get this O4-like critical point from our approach. So now uh, I would like to focus on this uh, um, heavy ion collisions. In the case of heavy ion collisions, uh, we need to, the proposal is then we have to uh, somehow um, uh, couple classical gravity with the glasma or kinetic theory, that's the idea. And uh, however, we can now start with perturbative initial conditions at boundary and empty bulk ADS5. Unlike the Chester FA case, case where they have to put the shock wave inside the bulk. So our bulk will be completely empty at initial time. And then we populate the bulk by transfer of energy from the boundary. So that is the idea. And once the black hole or horizon is formed, formed in the bulk, it will continue to grow and try to suck up all the energy. So that's the kind of thing that we want to have. But then there's a twist in the story is that uh, what you actually see is that, uh, uh, that this transfer of energy is, is a rather, rather slow process. It occurs very, very slowly. And uh, at least at weak uh, coupling, and it's not actually given by the quasi normal mode of the, of the bulk theory. So, so so the, the story is actually a little bit complicated, but I will talk more about it soon. So let me first say what we actually are trying to do. So what we're actually trying to do is we take the Yangle sector, with, which lives in some G menu lambda theta, where lambda is a toothed coupling and theta is a theta parameter. And similarly, the gravitational sector has some sources, which is the uh, source for the bulk metric. This is a source for the bulk dilaton field the source for the bulk axion field. So these are the lambda tilde and theta tilde parameters. And then we have this auxiliary action for sources. And this is how it will do once you set, uh, if in the feffman graham gauge, this is how this expansions look like. So if you have, if you solve the bulk metric self-consistently, you can extract this expectation values of the T menu H and K. And uh, once you know that, uh, so this is simply solving Einstein gravity uh, coupled with a negative cosmological constants coupled to a dilaton and axion field. And then in the, the equation of motion for the yang mills fields would look like this, which, uh, which where you take into in this D mu, we have to take into account the covariant derivative coming from this blue metric. Anyway, and this is, uh, and the, and this is how the sources and the here and the sources there will be determined. Note that for the strongly coupled system, I've taken the bare uh, toothed coupling to infinity so this starts with zero and it's only, only has this deformation beta by four trace F square coming from the blue, from the perturbative sector. So this is how the sources are determined. And, uh, the, and the scheme of solving was discussed by me and Edmond. And uh, this is how it goes that we first solve the Yang's equation with plasma initial conditions. 
we can see the talk by David Miller today, uh, sorry, on, on, yeah, in this conference. And we can do exactly what David and Andy Ip are doing. We can simply solve in the first iteration, the plasma initial condition, the standard plasma initial conditions. In this background, in the first iteration, we just simply set the blue metric to the physical itamunu, and we set lambda to be constant and theta to be zero. And we then just do the initial plasma uh, simulations. And once we have the plasma simulations, we can then use, the, use it to compute the sources for the gravitational theory. Because from the plasma, we can obtain Ts, the blue T, the blue tree F trace F square, the blue trace FF tilde. Once we get them, we know the sources for the gravitational theory. And once we compute them, then we can solve this gravitational theory with empty ADS5 bound initial conditions. And we get the unique gravitational solution this way. And we follow just the scheme. Once we get this gravitational solution, then we can go back here and solve uh, and again obtain the and uh, obtain this red uh, T-menu. We can know the, the, how the gra gravitational T-menu looks like uh, or the expectation value of the dual holographic sector uh, T-menu looks like. And similarly, the other operators and they, this will deform the tooth coupling, the theta parameter and the G-menu of the, of the plasma. Now. And then we again solve plasma but with the same initial conditions once again. And, and then once we solve the plasma, we again obtain uh, the sources for the gravitational theory. And we again iterate, keep on iterating until we get convergence. And once we have full convergence, the full T-menu will also be conserved. That, that is something that we already shown. Now in practice, of course, the question is, does it really work? Uh, and, uh, and what we have shown is that in this spe specific homogeneous case, it actually works. We take a very simple homogeneous cons configuration. It's not expanding. It's, and, and then if we see in four iterations, this very well uh, converges. But the interesting thing is that the transfer of energy from the, from the yang mill sector to the holographic sector and from the holographic sector uh, is actually very, very slow. So eventually, the black hole takes up all the energy, but if you put uh, the, all the energy in the, in the scalar sector, in, in, in the, in the, sorry, in the, in the gauge fields at the boundary of, is, is of, of order QS cube, you see that even at, at 40 times QS inverse time, 40 times the QS inverse time, uh, the energy of the yang mills fields have this decreased only by 20%. And the exchange energy, of course, uh, which is uh, the energy that is in the its interaction term, uh, also goes to zero eventually, but also very slowly. And the black hole grows also very, very slowly. So at 40 QS inverse, it has only increased by 20% only. And very importantly, we can take the limit numerically where we start with zero black hole mass. This is not a very easy, easy thing to do, but what we can, what uh, with Christian, we have been able to do that. And the apparent horizon also grows very slowly and we have an entropy production in the system. So everything works as expected. So uh, Shantan, can I have five more minutes? Hello? Yeah, sure. Please, please go ahead. Okay, so then I will try to go to this uh, story of hydrodynamics. So what you would expect since I have, I'm almost uh, uh, exhausting my time, I'll try to be brief. And anyway, this part of the talk was covered by Toshali. So I will just have, I'll just briefly summarize. So what you would say that both we have, okay, we weak, weak sector and strong sector. And at some time, uh, both whether we talk of kinetic theory or holography, both systems can be described by hydronomics at some point of time. So why don't we just try to understand by a two fluid model, everything. So after all, to understand late time behavior, we might think that a two fluid model will be sufficient. This is what we naively think. It turns out this is not true because if we couple two fluids, there is no way to irreversibly transfer energy from the boundary to the bulk. And, uh, and therefore we cannot, uh, so, if we, so you need a black hole to make it happen. And in fact, as I told you that the transfer of energy is happening very slowly, it's dominated by some pole, which is very close to the origin. So it kind of, it, 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 is, it, it kind of is dominated. By, I mean, it's, it's, you cannot just simply leave out in the effective theory. But the point is that we might expect that two fluid approximation could be a good approximation sufficient long period of time uh, because the transfer of energy is slow. And the other thing is that if we just couple two fluids, one of, we find two sound modes and we find uh, two shear modes 
And the systems cannot equilibrate uh, because they're two independent entropic current. The total entropy is simply the sum of the two, but at equilibrium, there are two independent entropic currents which are conserved and entropy production stops even if one system is at T1, another system is at T2. Only if you need a black hole to have this uh, kind of irreversible energy transfer. However, uh, let us see uh, what, what actually happens when we try to couple two fluids dynamically. And this is a talk by Toshali. Uh, all the details are there in her talk. I'll just give a summary of that. So if you try to couple one, weak, weak, uh, one weakly coupled uh, fluid to a strongly coupled fluid, what you indeed see that you have an attractor, it's a hybrid attractor. And uh, uh, so this attractor is a 2D surface and this attractor is an attractor surface rather than attractor curve. And each attractor curve is simply labeled by two things. It's a uh, epsilon t tau to the power four by three of the, of the weak system and epsilon tau to the power four by three of the strong system, which both goes to constant because both become uh, just simply perfect fluids expanding. So they will all both go to constraints, alpha and beta are the parameters and take any initial condition, it will go to evolve to one of these curves labeled by one alpha and one beta. And uh, this is an example that you can see that. So here the, here the solid curves are the attractor curves and the blues, blue represents the weak system. Uh, uh, sorry, the blue will be the, yeah, weak system. The red would be the uh, strong system and, and, uh, and the yellow is the full system. And one of the important things that we see is that we find bottom up thermalization. So at initial time, you can, you can show that the, all the energy should always be concentrated in the perturbative sector. So if you want to somehow microscopically match this kind of uh, two fluid model to some microscopic theory, it has to have bottom up thermalization inside it, which means that the, the initial conditions should be such that the physical energy density in the blue sector should be much, much larger compared to the, or infinitely larger compared to the energy in the holographic sector. And this is what we find. And, and this is a plot of that. So, and what you see is as follows that, uh, uh, although in the blue sector is, is, is a red sector is a, weak, is a weak sector, which has more energy compared to this, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah. And then, but eventually you see that the blue sector dominates again. Sorry, the red sector will dominate again, which means the perturbative sector is going to come back and re-dominate. So that is an interesting feature of the two fluid model. So what you see is that it's kind of reminiscent of the hydron gas transformation. And uh, what we see is as follows that uh, if we, uh, for, uh, so you might think that Okay, as I said, there are two sound modes to, to, to shear modes, but if you look at any attractor curve, the full system can be described as a, as, as a single fluid. But the properties of the fluid, the equation of state and the shear viscosity will determine by the alpha and beta parameters that label the curve. For example, the eta by S of the full, full thing be determined by the eta by S, the C eta and C eta red, these are the eta by S of individual sectors. They will, be and they will determine the full eta by S in this particular way. But intermediate times, you can also define some kind of effective shear viscosity. And as you see, during the crossover, it goes down and again comes up. And, uh, and this is an effective interaction between the two systems that is maximal during the crossover time as well. And this, this interaction time is actually based, is responsible for the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So it can be thought of as a measure of the bulk viscosity, if you would like. So this is how it looks. And the other interesting thing that you come to see is that uh, typically what you will have, unless very extreme kind of conditions, the, the weak system will always hydronomize much later compared to the strong system. However, if you, enter, if, you, if, if you keep lowering the total energy of the system at some reference time, which is QS inverse, so you see that the tot as the total energy goes down, the, the hydronomization time of the weak sector, it becomes very uh, twice than the, what the usual thing is. So if you had no coupling, it will be close to 10, but here it is 12, but then it becomes uh, 25, 0. 0.5. And if there is no coupling, uh, it, it would be for the, the, this thing would hydronomize at one, but it now hydronomizes two when the total energy is small, but then it actually becomes much closer to the real value as the total energy is decreased. So you see that there's an enormous hierarchy in the hydronomization times. Uh, so one system can hydronomize very quickly, 
uh, even with, when, the, when it's a small system collision, perhaps, and then the other uh, thing can take enormously long time to handle. So I will skip this part because I don't have uh, much time. So this is just to explain. So one of the just one of the things that I want to just talk uh, em emphasize in our model is that when we couple a kinetic theory with a MIS instead of a black hole, what we are doing is to coupling is to couple the kinetic theory and the black hole. Now, um, what we find is that there are this uh, sector of modes which behave very much perturbatively. The non-perturbative corrections turn out to be even at infinite mutual coupling. When, when the system becomes fully conformal, even at that value, the actual non perturbative contributions to these observables are less than point at about 0.01%. Or so. It's really extremely tiny. So it looks very interesting that there's many class of observables that can be described very well within the ambit of perturbation theory, even in our way of doing things. So, okay, so now we have some insights into why this transfer of energy is so slow. But uh, since I don't have time, much time to discuss the quasi-normal modes of the hybrid system, maybe I just simply go to the conclusions now. So our main conclusions are that semi-holographic can be consistent way to understand the non-perturbative dynamics of an asymptotically free theory like QCD in large and limit. And the, our key proposal is that we view the perturbative and holographic sectors as two kind of different series expansion, which together make sense. And they are, and they are kind of self-consistent and isolated on their own rights. So, uh, so they don't kind of mix with each other except through this uh, self-consistency conditions, at least in the large end limit. And, uh, and they are deformed by the marginal couplings and effective metrics of the mutual sector. And, we, and our proposal survives very key consistency checks with thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And we always find emergent conformality at in, infinite mutual coupling. So the interesting applicable cases uh, when the mutual coupling is small. Uh, so we have now a proposal to simulate HIC and uh, what we find is large and limit and small mutual coupling, the transfer of energy to the black hole occurs very slowly, but by hydronomic model, which should de describe the system at intermediate times reveals universality of bottom of thermalization and emergence of attractor surface where the full system can be described as a single fluid with the equation of state and transport coefficients determined by the initial conditions only in a limited way because the initial for a given initial many initial conditions will go to the same attractor curve but the it, there's some memory of initial conditions retained by this attractor uh, attractor surface in this way and now i can explain what we actually what, what actually meant but when the strong were too weak to hurt the weak the weak had to be strong enough to leave so what i meant here was actually that uh, although we start with uh, the weak system dominating uh, the strong system actually dominates in the fluid approximation only for intermediate times. And then the weak actually comes back in dominance. And uh, so uh, then the weak had to be strong enough to leave, which means that the weak then actually slowly transfers its em empties itself to the bulk black hole. But that happens at very long time scale. So that is sort of uh, uh, the picture maybe. And we also obtain some new insights on small versus large system collisions in this way, especially enormous hierarchy in hydrodynamic times in small systems. And many observables can be described well by perturbative physics. Okay, so I have nothing more to say. This is some outlook that we want to do in the future. And thank you. So I've already taken more, more than my time. So. Yeah, thanks, Ayan, for this wonderful talk. I'm glad uh, you agreed to give the talk. <laughs> after so much insistence. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are open to questions. So maybe I can ask a few of them. So uh, as far as I understand, is it uh, fair to say that uh, uh, we can think of uh, this uh, kind of metric coupling uh, as um, mimicking the perturbative and non-perturbative scales if uh, uh, they are not very strongly overlapping or is it a fair way to look at this problem? Like uh, sometimes uh, in thermal QCD, we have this temperature scale and the magnetic scale. They're, they may be well separated. And mm -hmm. then uh, one can think of uh, these uh, physics in these two systems to be the subsystem that you were mentioning or is it more than that yeah, yeah it's a very nice question so i think for what we are doing is very important there is some kind of inter intermediate scale like some saturation scale where the coupling is uh, of order one 
in a way which is uh, not too small or not too too large and in a way you could think as that scale as a sort of a effective scale that controls the mutual interactions so otherwise you have the same kind of scales like you have in normal perturbation theory and uh, to begin with uh, and then for the for the strong coupling system the scale is actually unless you have lambda you can have lambda qct that would be the natural scale for the strong coupling system and if you take it to be conformal then the temperature sets a scale for the for the for the non, for the non perturbative system for the holographic system so you have actually uh, basically i would say uh, scales like the temperature itself or lambda qct uh, whichever is uh, whichever is smaller uh, whichever is sorry whichever is larger rather and you have a saturation scale qs which is a which is called intersystem dynamics and you have the traditional g square t and uh, uh, and uh, these kind of scales the, the magnetic scale and the debye mass scale that kind of scales like you have in perturbation theory so those and oh, all these scales have uh, well there may be other dynamically generated scales okay and uh, regarding uh, suppose uh, you are in a non equilibrium phase and of course in a non equilibrium system different uh, observables may equilibrate at different times there is no unique equilibration uh, time scale in that sense and uh, is it possible to uh, model this within uh, your framework like is it possible to have like a system very away from equilibrium versus um, which is closer to equilibrium and how they interact and yeah yeah well um these kind of questions have been studied within holography as well i mean uh, one yeah so i think if you look at the energy momentum tensor like when it hydron uh, when it hydronomizes even within that i think uh, uh, typically what you find of course is the energy density and pressure and anisotropy hydronomizes or can be described by foster hydronomics at the same kind of time scale uh, but i think if you uh, but people have found like there is a different time scales what they call us uh, ussization time where the energy and uh, pressure are described by uh, by you know equation of state locally and so there are of course different time scales that have been discussed within the context of uh, uh, this kind of uh, holographic models um, but indeed i think one can try to understand uh, 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 so i think the the, the thermalization of course will have be a much more richer picture in this uh, context and uh, the, if you look at boundary observables versus bulk observables uh, of course the real observables are kind of mix of both both but if some observable gets contribution mainly from the boundary that will have probably a very different thermalization time scale compared to uh, the observable if you it gets main contribution from the bulk because uh, that will thermalize much faster for example so uh, in a way here uh, in this context maybe i would naively say that uh, depending which observable gets contribution mostly from the boundary and bulk there will be different thermalization times okay thanks and uh, yeah any further questions we have people can just type in here and or just ask directly it's fine i have one question yes uh, yeah uh, please so, go ahead uh, so i am uh, how do you define a race frame here because since you have two subsystem in the bihydrodynamic model so if i want to define a race frame u mu so how do you define uh, that here you, you mean uh, a thermal frame not a race frame right uh, right uh, like uh, i want to define my energy density Which well uh, no, no. as i said uh, there will be only one frame because uh, if the system is a mutual uh, okay. so here okay, okay no okay for, you mean for the case of the york inflow you're asking specifically for that or you wanted ask no, in, ge in general in general in, in thermally in, yes. you know in general there there will be two different frames of course uh, in uh, but always. in york inflow there is always there is a one frame because there's only one uh, only one direction of uh, where the system is expanding so it comes trivially from the kinematics uh, but in general of course they they can be out of equilibrium there will be two different frames 
in equilibrium there can be only one frame right because that's a definition of equilibrium so u mu for the two subsystem will be one right i mean no 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 not single... not one not one because they have to be i mean they will be basically you you remember this a factor is yes. uh, this effective g0 zero term so it will be yes. a one over a uh, zero essentially where one of the okay. a will be different for each sectors but uh, but it will be proportional to 1 0 0 so yeah one okay yeah that's that because that is the only consistent way you can describe equilibrium because in equilibrium you, there cannot be two frames by definition right, yeah. right. thank you Hi, Ian. Uh, so thank you a lot for, for this great talk, actually. Um, I would like to, to ask you, so uh, what would be the next, um, the next questions that you would like to, to, to answer with, by extending this framework? I mean, you, you, have, you have now looked at two um, hydrodynamic, two fluids. Uh, you have had young wheels with, uh, with, um, with your holographic system. So what other models do you wish to, to look at? So I think now we should stop doing this toy models and just probably try to tackle something on its own complexity. So I think the first case would be just to understand the boost invariant ex expansion, but not with two fluids, but with a black hole and say a kinetic theory. That would be a sort of, uh, sort of an aim uh, to do that. Um, that would be, uh, I think, uh, or uh, maybe black hole and a fluid also that is fine. But but what we need is, uh, is something uh, something a bit more non-trivial than the simple toy models that we are doing. Uh, yeah, well, they are and also non-trivial. <laughs> they're also non-trivial, right? Right. But <laughs> but somehow it's, it's, we cannot. Uh, just, you, I mean, we, we are not able to patch everything together. We have some ideas about how they patch together, but we don't know yet how they actually patch together. And these numerics are formidable because uh, you, when you look into how the bulk is affecting the equation of motion for the boundary, the higher derivative terms uh, come. So suppose your bulk equation of motion is second order in time, you get higher time derivatives, which because when you, when, you, when you renormalize the bulk operator, you get higher derivatives of the sources that is well known from holographic renormalization. And then what you have to do, you have to kill the higher derivatives in initial, in initial time. Uh, and then, and, but if it is not numerically well controlled, you know, it, it kind of builds up and causes instabilities. That is something that we see. Uh, so, okay, so there's, there's very lot of numerical challenges in doing these things. And Christian was able to help us a lot, uh, even with the simple ADS-4. With ADS-5, it comes a new set of challenges because the lock terms in the bulk and Chebyshev grid doesn't work very not very easily. You have to do something more. And now if you have to combine it with this kind of uh, mutual coupling and self consistent solving, it becomes much harder. So there are of course uh, many, but we, are, we have very good graduate students. Uh, so Sukhru and Toshali would be <laughs> probably taking up some of these challenges. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Uh, I don't see any in the chat box. So maybe, yeah, so let's thank Ayan again for this wonderful talk and